For a recently published paper in Nature and Science of Sleep, I wanted to start with some background material. Dr. Guimano was the first to recognize a connection between sleep disordered breathing and insomnia, and that was back in the 1970s. Uh, while there have been a few studies since that time, uh, most of the work began again in the 2000s, and we published a study in 2001 showing that uh, insomnia and sleep disordered breathing were very uh, tightly linked in a series of crime victims uh, who were presenting for treatment of nightmares and insomnia. This was the first study to use nasal cannula pressure transducer. And in this study of 44 crime victims, 90% were diagnosed with OSA and with UARS. Another study that we did more recently uh, looked at prospective evaluations of patients complaining of insomnia who were trying to figure out why they were waking up at night. This type of research had not been done previously. And with these 20 individuals, we asked them for their explanations. And virtually all of them gave non-breathing related explanations, mostly psychological factors, perhaps other physical factors such as noise, temperature, and so on. But it turns out that when we put them in the lab for a diagnostic study, 90% of their awakenings were preceded by a respiratory related event, an apnea, a hypopnea, or a flow limitation event. Now, when we think about trying to treat these individuals, we normally recognize that the airflow curve should be rounded on inspiration and expiration as far as our target would go, but we often run into this difficulty in dealing with respiratory effort related arousals or flow limitations. Uh, the two discrete terms for upper airway resistance. And what happens is we conduct a titration trying to eliminate the RERAS, but instead we end up with expiratory pressure intolerance. And so, as you can see on these next three slides, this is our normal breathing curve. This is an example of flow limitation with snoring. And this, again, is the example of what happens when you try to treat RERAS with CPAP often you get expiratory pressure intolerance. And this is a sign of both subjective and objective discomfort. So for example, many patients who are prone to anxiety, such as insomniacs, will develop claustrophobia. Some people will reject CPAP quite vigorously because they do not like it, and some even perceive it as a traumatizing experience. Our experience has been that the use of advanced PAP devices, such as ASV and auto bilevel, are very good at resolving these issues. And in this particular algorithm, what you see is a progression specific to the use of the ASV device, where there would be persistent RERAS uh, when treated with a traditional PAP mode, expiratory pressure intolerance emerges, uh, expiratory pressure intolerance may actually persist and aggravate sleep fragmentation, eventually central apneas and complex sleep apnea may develop, and then you must institute a different form of PAP therapy, such as ABPAP or ASV, to overcome that. Regardless of whether the patient develops the central apneas, it's very common for these individuals to develop expiratory pressure intolerance. And again, this is the cardinal process. Flow limitations lead to expiratory pressure intolerance when the treatment is not going well with PAP therapy. This obviously is our goal, to normalize the airflow curve. In our paper in Nature and Science of Sleep, a retrospective non-randomized controlled study on auto-adjusting dual pressure positive airway pressure therapy for a consecutive series of complex insomnia disorder patients, we worked with several hundred patients who had come through our center. And to highlight this for you, we divided those who completed the project, which was uh, retrospectively uh, uh, looked at in a chart review, those who completed were those who actually were using PAP at some level. And we divided into PAP users and partial users. And you can see the two groups are made up of 246 in the users and 56 in the partial users. And then below, you can see that the ASV and ABPAP patients were using quite a bit, more than six hours a night, and often averaging close to 90% of nights or more. The partial users were averaging more in the 10 to 15 hours per week. And on this first slide of the results, 
you see for total insomnia scores that uh, whether it's all the sample, the, pay, uh, the um, regular users, the partial users, everyone had a large effect size. But you can see the effect sizes are larger for the PAP users compared to the partial users in terms of a reduction in the insomnia severity index, a dropping in the PAP users uh, well below the cutoff of 15 for moderate insomnia, despite having started out close to 20, um, which is just under uh, the, the uh, mark for severe insomnia. If we look at it by device type, there really is no difference. Again, you have large effects uh, in both groups. Uh, the ASV users seem to be more or do show uh, a greater uh, reduction than the uh, partial users. Um, these are statistically significant between groups, but again, this is a retrospective, non-randomized controlled study. And then last, the auto buy level uh, device again shows the um, same uh, changes, not quite as much uh, with auto buy level in the partial user group, but then that sample is very small, so it may not be as relevant. Um, and then the last slide, difficult to follow, so we'll leave it up a bit. It's really talking about breaking out the first three questions of the insomnia severity index, which specifically refer to SOI, sleep onset insomnia, SMI, sleep maintenance insomnia, and EMA, uh, early morning awakenings. And you can see in each group, when you look at the black bar, that's the user intake, and then the next one over with the polka dots is their follow-up. And you can see that's the largest improvement uh, across each of these dimensions for SOI, SMI, and EMA. Uh, and then you can see that the uh, partial users have some improvements, but it's not as much. Okay, that wraps it up. And I just want to remind you again that this has been the key for us in our efforts to treat insomnia patients, PTSD patients, depression patients who suffer co-occurring sleep disordered breathing, whether it's sleep apnea or upper airway resistance. When we get into our efforts to normalize that airflow curve on the titration, we obviously have to eliminate the respiratory effort-related arousals as mandated by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. When we try to do so with traditional PAP therapy, even CPAP, APAP, even BPAP sometimes, we end up with expiratory pressure intolerance and sometimes central apneas. When we use manually titrated, manually titrated attended sleep studies uh, that override the auto-adjusting uh, algorithms for auto bilevel or ASV, we have found that we can smooth that curve out and produce much better results, more restorative sleep for these patients, and they're able to be more compliant, uh, use the device more hours, and it seems to us, as a result, have a greater impact on their insomnia scores. Thank you very much.